I thought you'd enjoy clarifying this one. Okay. <laughs> the quantum level. Ah. Is that where the manifest and unmanifest realities meet? Categorically not. I don't know more confusion in the last right. 30 years than has come from quantum physics. It mm -hmm. just is a nightmare. So let me try and back up and weave a few things in with that and see if I can help clarify some of this. And I promise you this is endlessly confusing because so many people have so many just flat out wrong notions and then confused notions. And incidentally, I did all of my graduate work in biophysics, quantum physics, and uh, biochemistry. So this is something I know professionally. Right. And I can guarantee you that the Schrodinger quantum wave equation has absolutely nothing to do with these kinds of spiritual realities, except insofar as everything is a manifestation of spirit. But let me try to explain where the confusion has come from and why people actually think the quantum level has something to do with unmanifest mind. And by people, I don't mean ordinary people. Uh, you find these misconceptions in Deepak Chopra's and people like Friedrich Capra very much good-heartedly want to take something like modern quantum physics and give some proof for mysticism, and it just doesn't work. And let me start by saying that the modern quantum revolution that everybody talks about took place in 1905 when Max Planck introduced the notion of quanta. Most of the revolutionary things that were introduced, including the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, all of those happened by 1925. The collapse of the Schrodinger wave packet, which is what people refer to by the quantum level and the quantum wave packet collapsing, all of that was figured out by 1925. So this leading-edge massive breakthrough in modern physics is about a century old. Well, that's number one. Number two, here's why what's happening at a quantum level so led itself to a mystical misinterpretation, including right up to the movie What the Bleep Do We Know? And about 20 years ago, the confusions were so deep that I did a book called Quantum Questions. And I went back and took the 13 pioneering founders of modern quantum physics, including Bohr and Heisenberg and de Broglie and Schrodinger and Eddington. And I took all of their writings, including Einstein's, everything that they had written on mysticism and edited them to input, put all of, those, all of their writings into that book. So you can find all of their original writings on physics and mysticism. And as I point out in the introduction, not one of those 13 individuals, not one, felt that quantum mechanics had anything to do with spiritual realities or mysticism. Not one. And yet, all of them were mystics. Right. And they were mystics not because of physics, but despite it. And the actual failures of quantum mechanics to account for anything spiritual basically was the last straw that broke the camel's back and helped all of them become mystics in the sense of metaphysics. And so it has nothing to do with quantum physics. Now, the reason people get confused and the reason it sounds like it is basically this sort of general fact, which is that what we're trying to do with equations like quantum mechanics is do things like find the location of an electron, predict where an electron is going to be. That's sort of what science does. Uh, predict where Uranus will be next year. And Newtonian physics does extremely well in predicting large objects moving at slow speed. And when you get down to quantum events or relativistic events, then other kinds of physics kick in. And at the very, very small levels, the only equations that we've ever had that came close to predicting where an electron might be are the Schrodinger wave equations. And they're just a series of very, very complex differential calculus equations that, in a sense, if you square the results of those equations, you get the probability of finding an electron in a given space. Now, the tricky part is that you can't say exactly where that electron will be until you actually measure it. And then something happens, and this is the tricky part, that's called the collapse of the wave packet or the collapse of the Schrodinger wave equation or the collapse of the quantum packet. And what that really means is at the moment you measure this sort of poofy probability space, then the electron actually appears or whatever it is you're measuring actually appears. Right. Now, all of the physicists looking at it at that time did not believe that the measuring device creates the reality. Not one of them. But mm -hmm. every misinterpretation today does that. It says when you measure something, you quaff it into existence. You're responsible for the existence of the electron and all of that. And that's just narcissistic, boomeritis nonsense. 
And it's so easy to see how it got started, but your big old ego doesn't create electrons. Right. And so, but it sounds very mystical. It's like, whoa, pow, there it is. Right. So you go from that first mistake to the second mistake, which is really the big one. And you can argue until the cows come home about what the Schrodinger wave packet means. And philosophers have been doing it for almost a century. Schrodinger himself, incidentally, was one of the most profound Vedanta Hindu believers anywhere, east or west. And his writings on finding the pure self, who am I, and the witness, that has nothing to do with quantum potential whatsoever, are some of the most beautiful mystical writings in the world. And I included those in the book, of course, and I highly recommend people read them. They, I weep when I read them. They're absolutely exquisite. And so, But the second fundamental mistake, once people move from saying, oh, something must be spiritual must be going on here, is they try to take something like the quantum vacuum potential or some quantum level of reality that seems to be unmanifest, and they want to say, okay, that's spirit, that's Brahman, that's Tao, and then it gives rise to this manifest world over here. And they want to say that as a concrete actual reality. In other words, there really is this thing over here that gives rise to this material electron over here. Now, already you've got a dualistic spirit. Right. You just fundamentally messed it up right there. Actual non-dual spirit is the suchness of everything that's arising. It doesn't cause anything to do anything. So it's the actual isness, the suchness of emptiness of every single thing anywhere in the cosmos simultaneously. So pure emptiness leaves everything exactly the way it finds it. It doesn't push or pull anything because it's not separate from anything. And one of the analogies is you can say you can talk about the ocean and its waves, and then there's the wetness of the ocean and the wetness of the waves. Mm -hmm. And wetness is equally present in all the waves. A big wave is not wetter than a small wave. Nor does wetness cause one wave to do something and another wave to do anything else. Wetness is simultaneously all present in every single part of all the ocean at all times. Wetness does not give rise to the ocean. Wetness is not the quantum potential that's different (laughs) from the ocean. And so their fundamental mistake is to make spirit a dualistic entity. And that's the fundamental problem now. So now you have three things. You have the real spirit, the pure suchness, the unqualifiable emptiness, the ground of all being, which is equally present in all things manifest and unmanifest. So that's Mm -hmm. item number one, if we can number them. And then item number two is the manifest world. And then item number three is, well, is there an unmanifest? Is there something that is creating this manifest world? Since it's not pure spirit, what else could it be? Is the quantum level plugged into anything? And, And if so, what is it? And so then you have to go back and actually look at physics. And as you know, what they're trying to plug the quantum level into now is strings. Right. Mm-hmm. And then strings are basically, now it's 11th dimensional mathematical dimension. Is that what we're up to now? We're up to 11 dimensions? We're up to 11. I think it's just going to keep going. Yeah. And when they passed nine dimensions, everybody mm-hmm. agreed that it's probably now so abstract that you're never going to be able to find empirical evidence that we'll be able to decide one way or another in any scientific, typical scientific sense, whether string theory is true or not. Right Mm -hmm. now, people that like it, and I happen to like it, like it because it's elegant and beautiful and extremely exquisite. And if it's true, it might account for a lot of things in physics that are unaccounted for now. But if it's true, it's a Pythagorean heaven. <laughs> it's really nothing right. to do. It's so off in, in mental hyperspace. And it's okay yeah. with me, but that's usually not what people mean by spirit, which is supposed to be non-intellectual and non-mental. This is just one big brain. Anyway, uh, that's the problems of trying to get into physics uh, to sort of prove mysticism. Now, I have sort of two kind of para theories that I would, I would inject very quickly. If you look at the traditional great chain of being, and it goes on the manifest side of the street, when actually the manifest world is creating, first spirit gives rise to soul, then soul gives rise to mind, then mind gives rise to body or biological level, and then body gives rise to matter. And that's sort of the involutionary sequence. And we're not saying this occurred mm-hmm. in time. That's just sort of, that's a kind of a ontological order of levels. Right. And in Plotinus, he called that outward movement, or, or Bindo called it involution, and Plotinus called it efflux. 
sort of a throwing outward of spirit. And then once matter is created or the potential for matter is created, then evolution occurs from matter back to biological living things, back to body, back to mind, back to soul, back to spirit. And that's kind of an overall sort of story. Uh, about how it unfolds. And if you just use that as as a counterexample, then what is giving rise to the material level is not spirit per se, but prana, the the body level, the bioenergy level. So if if we ever find that strings or quantum levels or whatever the heck we decide is down there is rising and bubbling up out of a sea of something, that something is probably prana. It's probably bioenergy. And that's probably what people are pointing to. That's not spirit, and it's not the Tao, and it's not all this other stuff. But if you want a kind of a, quote, far out interpretation, that one makes much more sense than trying to plug the quantum level into right. Brahman or Tao. It's just not going to work. But that's at least the possibility, and it at least stops you from qualifying the unqualifiable. See, these people are trying right. to get work out of it, and it just was not going to happen. <laughs> So, so you can, so you have to be really careful with that. And but here's, I said the second problem was sort of even worse. But the third problem is the worst of all, and that's even if you disagree with part one and part two, the third part is to me the the killer, and it's hurt mysticism just enormously, and that is that as you know there are at least first person and third person approaches to reality, to spirit, to the world, to whatever we wish to approach. The first person is a first person term. I find an interior realization. I introspect, I meditate, I look into my mind or my heart or my soul, I feel my feelings, whatever it is. It's a first person series of realities. And then there are a third person which generally is taken to mean an objective view, a it view, a him, her, they, it view. So you're taking maybe a conceptual view of it. You're looking at, you know, the Schrodinger wave equation is a third person approach to reality. Right. And so if when you learn the Schrodinger wave equation, you're not enlightened. <laughs> you haven't awakened to the ground of all being. You're probably just a, you know, a dorky mathematician someplace. <laughs> As I was, so I'm speaking for all dorks. But you can learn third-person maps and symbols and ideas. You're not going to awaken. That has nothing to do with contemplative realization. And so we say, well, it's a third-person approach to the same reality that you're getting in the first-person approach. And in fact, it's actually not, as we talked about. They're actually telling that part's even wrong. Right. So it discouraged basically by saying this is proof of that reality. No, the actual proof of that reality is in first-person terms, and there are very specific in sense, scientific experiments for interior exploration. There are injunctions known as meditative practices. You have to learn to concentrate the mind very powerfully. Most meditative disciplines don't allow you to move on until you can focus on an object without losing awareness of it for at least five minutes. And the average adult can focus on an object without losing attention for about 40 seconds. So it can take sometimes two or three years to learn to train your mind so they can focus with that degree of concentration. Then from there, you might have to go, then you can go on and work on spiritual contemplative development interior development according to St. John of the Cross or St. Teresa or working on koans in the Renzi system or working on interior inquiry in Vedanta. But the idea that you can just sort of, you know, learn mathematical equations and that's the same reality from the third person is deeply confused. Right. And I say what it's really done is hurt the contemplative field, the field of first person realities by saying, no, wait a minute, that doesn't prove anything. The only proof is an interior realization. And then the theory map is a map of interiors, not a map of what you think quantum realities are doing. Mm -hmm. So we've got people, just these three confusions have been so extensive that it's almost impossible now to even talk about you know, physics and quantum realities and spirit and so on, because everybody makes these assumptions that it's just completely obvious. Mm -hmm. And I watch, for example, you know, what the bleep do we know? And I would say more or less that every actual assertion they made about physical realities, meaning quantum realities, and their relation to spiritual realities is categorically false. And I was staggering to me because it was so popular. And you notice all the authorities they bring on, they never really identify them. (laughs) (laughs) They're not authorities. (laughs) 
but it's that people so want to believe in mystical realities, and that's so fantastic. But there are ways to discover these mystical realities. And if you think the great founding physicists believe that nonsense, go read Quantum Questions. Right. Yeah. And quote yeah. somebody else other than physics. <laughs> quote, <laughs> quote this unknown dude from what is bleep. I mean, give your authorities that way. But don't, right. <laughs> no, no, don't go quoting Einstein or Schrodinger. Well, is it is it fair to say that um, a lot of the confusion came from, you know, it feels like a lot of Western science, modern Western science, has been sort of trying to explain away subjectivity. Yeah. yeah. And then they got into this realm where just subjectivity was, you couldn't seemed reduce to it be. down to anything anymore. Well, it seemed to be, yeah. I mean, that, and that's, again, what happens is whenever you get into an area of any discipline and you push the edges of it, they go fuzzy. Right. And then you, you have a mystical heart. We all do. Everybody's born intuiting their ever-present, unborn, true nature. Mm-hmm. And so it's always whispering in your ear. And you're always looking for some reason to jump on it and believe it or have a language you can talk about it. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened for a lot of people. The kind of Tao of physics or what the bleep do we know, they didn't have any language at all. And all of a sudden they had a language, they could talk about it, the interrelated dynamic pattern of all the web of all particles and all this kind of stuff. And it was better than nothing, and, and, and more than that, it seemed to be grounded in science, so it was okay if you thought this way. Right. But in terms of actual real physics or actual real mysticism, they were incorrect on both counts. It was just bad mm-hmm. physics and sloppy mysticism. Right. And the marriage of bad physics and bad mysticism has been a nightmare. And so what we're trying to do is tease it apart and say, here's good physics, and here's mysticism that has its own proofs. And, and let, let's put them both together, but let's don't think that one is proving the other, and let's don't confuse third-person approaches with first-person approaches. Right. And exactly. it's definitely the case that modern Western science, it wasn't that it rejected interiority per se. It's that it just focused on the – I'll use the great chain of being just as a reference point. I don't believe it's there you know, in any – archetypal pre-given way but all they really did is they weren't studying spirit they weren't studying the soul they weren't studying mind they weren't studying the body they went right down and started you know really focused on matter and if you actually look at physics the laws of physics don't have room for life mm-hmm. let alone mind or soul or spirit so why pick on spirit? <laughs> i mean mm-hmm. that's it's one of the problems is if you focus your attention so tightly on rocks and formulate laws for rocks and then you're surprised when it can't account for the life of a dog. <laughs> and it can't. You know, physics says, well, we can predict, I mean, where Neptune will be, you know, and so on. And go, you can't predict where my dog will be five minutes from now. Right. And so my dog doesn't fit the laws of physics. I don't – why are people getting all upset that spirit doesn't or something? <laughs> and so, so what Western science did was make extraordinarily spectacular discoveries in the material realm. Mm-hmm. And then people who focused only on that got so hungry for life and mind and soul and spirit that they started doing very strange things with physics. <laughs> totally understandable, but it's just a, not a good road to, to travel up. And right. again, the most embarrassing thing is, as one of the very early reviewers pointed out, is that, look, if right now we say that this, the present version of physics is the same as Buddha's enlightenment, it's just a, from a different angle, but it's the same reality, same thing. And incidentally, the version of physics at that time was bootstrap theory, which is rejected today. It's just what that guy said. If we hook Buddha's enlightenment to this theory today, then does Buddha lose his enlightenment when the next theory comes in? Right, right. You can't have it both ways. Exactly. And guess what? Buddha got hooked to bootstrap. Bootstrap's out. I guess Buddha lost his enlightenment. So, So everybody backpedaled real fast, and now it's strings. Well, you can't keep doing that. Because Buddha didn't change his enlightenment. I don't know why they are. Right. So, you know, big mind hasn't changed. It's empty and doesn't have content. And it's timeless and formless. It's not strings. It's not quantum. It's not manifest or unmanifest or both or neither. Right. And people keep trying to qualify spirit to get it into physics. And that's their first major mistake. And they never recover from that. Right. It feels like there's like a myth that the more we dig down, the lower turtles that we explore, maybe we'll find something there. Except all we found there are strings, and strings exactly. have disappeared into 11th dimensions, and we don't know where those go. But right. they don't look like unmanifest spirit anymore. 
Right. And <laughs> so <laughs> Buddha lost his enlightenment yet again. And you just can't just stop it. You want to know your own mind? Inquire, who am I? Right. It's a short trip to the answer. And it's not going to keep changing on you because emptiness doesn't have any parts. And it doesn't have any dimensions. And it doesn't have any form at all. And so the recognition of that, which is the same as that pure consciousness that we were talking about, the same as your primordial self, which is your own timeless moment right now, your own pure presence in this timeless moment, in which everything is arising, that can be known directly by first person inquiry and awareness and meditation. And if you can chase third person objects down into strings if you want to, which I happen to find fascinating, but don't equate it with Buddha's enlightenment seen from a different perspective because you're screwing Buddha up every step down. Right. And it's just wrong. Yeah, like I say, it's bad physics and it's bad mysticism. Totally understandable. Totally wrong. Right. And we've just got to kind of shake that off. Now, I have to find the exploration, like I say, as you push down, turtles go down and turtles go down. And you get hold on smaller and smaller. I think that is fascinating. But like I said, I think it really it's disappearing into strings now. And if strings are plugged into anything, like I say, my guess is, and the only thing that makes sense from a big picture, they're plugged into prana. They're plugged into the the ontologically senior level, which is life or body. And life is plugged into mind, and mind is plugged into soul, and soul is plugged into spirit. And if you want to do that kind of thing. Right. And that's fine. I think there's room for that kind of stuff. And we're not going to know this until we start exploring subtle energies more. And there's a lot of actual empirical work on some of what we might call the grosser of the subtler energies. You know, the traditions have a whole spectrum of subtle energy that starts from the four physical known forces of strong and weak nuclear, electromagnetic, and gravitational, and then extends into what you usually call etheric and then astral and psychic energies and causal energies and so on. And whether those are there or not, they, there's a lot of evidence from different ways that they are there. And there's actually empirical evidence, Western research, on the, what we call the etheric and to some degree the astro, and particularly the uh, Japanese and Motoyama's done a lot of work. In this country, Tiller and an enormous number of other people, starting with Burr at Yale, have done very, very legitimate scientific work on this. Mm-hmm. Now, if we get a little bit more understanding of what might actually be subtle energies, and those fields are actually there, then my guess is way down the road, 50 to 100 years from now, strings plug into subtle energies. Right. And matter, this is what the traditions, starting with Plotinus, have always said. Matter crystallizes out of the life level, out of prana. Read Orbindo. I mean, if they're right, this is pretty clear cut. Mm -hmm. And matter is just this precipitate from a vast sea of bioenergy, of pranic energy. And prana, of course, is the second in the five sheaths. So in Vedanta, for example, you have the Anamaya Kosha, the material level, then the Prana Maya Kosha, the sheath of bioenergy, then Mono Maya Kosha, the sheath of mind, then Vijnana Maya Kosha, the sheath made of soul, and Ananda Maya Kosha, the sheath made of manifest spirit or causal spirit. And then all five of those arise on the ever-present unborn, which is simultaneously present to all of them and doesn't cause any of them, but is the suchness of all of them. Right. And so in that scheme, which you find east and west, like I say, from Plotinus all the way to Orbindo, it's pretty clear cut. Matter and quanta and strings are all arising from a vast sea of prana, the prana kosha, the sheath of bioenergy. And I believe that makes sense in a larger picture. And it satisfies, you know, the people who want a little, something a little spooky going on down there. Right. And it's plugged into something. Beautiful okay. model. It's very... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. It does make sense to me, and you can work it on an evolutionary way as well, and just sort of all plugs in, and and that's certainly the model that I've been using for a couple of decades, and that part is not, you know, I certainly did not invent that, and Mm -hmm. my earliest critique of the holographic paradigm and the Tao of physics kind of approaches, the dancing Wuli masters and so on, I carried essentially a similar critique. It hasn't changed for 20 (laughs) years because the essentials haven't changed. And I carried a version of that that was published in, you know, quite early on, and we carry it, I believe, now in Eye to Eye. And you can see it's the holographic paradigm, the critique of all of that. And same critique still holds. 